cinematographers, for example. That's always good to know when I'm talking, because I, sometimes I'm, I can go off on tangents, so thanks. Directors, yeah, and uh, just cineasts. I guess that's everybody, right? Okay. Um, we can talk about the emerging digital technology. Uh, now, I'm no expert on that. I use digital now, just like if you were here for John Jost's. Uh, he went digital, I think, 12, 14 years ago or something like that. <coughs> and uh, I think we've reached the point now where, um, you know, we've, we've heard, we've all heard about the demise of Kodak and uh, their bankruptcy. I don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe that's just the, that's the way <coughs> the dominoes fall. Um, it's still, the film's still viable. I, I brought two films I'm going to show you guys that are both shot on film. Since this is, I'm, I'm here for a documentary jury, and I, th I thought we would just, uh, I've done features, I've, uh, about 14 or 15 features, but far more documentaries, probably about 30 or 40. So I think we'll try to concentrate on uh, that, unless we've got you know, you know, interest in uh, any, other, any other areas. Uh, I'm just going to, Put in a little. Have you, are y'all familiar with this movie right here, Fast Food Nation? <laughs> yeah. um, it's a Richard Linklater film. That's a narrative. Yet we kind of filmed it like a documentary, and it's not like we're trying to make it nonfiction. It's just that um, I don't know. I think Linklater's style is pretty, you know, naturalistic, and I, I think that. Uh, Um, we uh, used handheld cameras. Uh, we used very well-known actors, though. That, that's sort of the problem because they break the, you know, the whole. You can't make it look like a documentary when you have Bruce Willis in there. It just doesn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, we tried to use sort of a subtle handheld look on this, and um, I'm just going to show you probably about mm, five or ten minutes of. Pick and big. What are you talking about? I speak on behalf of you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Sorry, oh, that's the. Yeah. I can't even dance. It's okay. so I'm like a remote. <laughs> so I'm simply the previous. Sorry? Yeah. It's okay. Like, can you, can you punch it up to, like, um, uh, chapter six, maybe? <clears throat> All it has is, you know, play, pause, and stop. Um, oh, really? Oh, well. <coughs> I'd run out of my office real quick. Yeah, that's I, I can see if I can. So yeah, I'm sort of a Luddite when it comes to the uh, digital technology, but um, I just cannot keep up with all the new digital cameras coming out. Some are coming out this week. What is it? Some are coming out this week. There's yeah. Tabs going on. What is it? Uh, are you talking NAB? NAB yeah. 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 I, I used to go to that. I'm so afraid to go now, and I'm just so overwhelmed by it. You know, the, the new cameras that come out, you know, they're, they're up to 4K now, the, the resolution. Um, I, I don't understand. <laughs> you know, uh, with that type of resolution on an actor, I think, even, I think actors are um, almost more worried about this than cinematographers. They're, uh, you know, they really pick up everything. They, you know, 4K resolution. I don't now. They're talking about Reds are now going into 5 5K. I, I, I can't see any reason for it except for the fact that compositing in, in a place like this, if you're using a green screen, if you're putting multiple layers in, you know, in post production, I see you know, 
validity to that. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, what, uh, just sidetracked what I was talking about. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, are anybody familiar with the uh, Alexa mm -hmm. camera? That's the one that I, th I just finished a feature on that, and it's, um, I think it's probably the closest you can get to the dynamic range, if you will, or the, the latitude of film. Uh, that's been the problem usually uh, in, uh, in my experience with uh, digital is that uh, the highlights will blow out really badly, you know what I mean? They claim now that uh, the Alexa and the Red both say they're 14 stops of latitude, but I don't really know what that means. <laughs> you know, they call it dynamic range. I guess it's the same thing you would find in uh, what audio technicians call dynamic range. Uh, they, uh, like for example, if you're shooting a Western, or if you, and you're shooting on 4K, uh, like a Red or an Alexa even, the, uh, you, you won't even see the clouds, you know, you can't, uh, you know, the clouds will just blow out because there's so, you, know, it, it, you can't handle the, uh, the latitude. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the, uh... I have a question for you. Yeah. A lot of your films, you know, <coughs> like this one before sunrise, before sunset, and when you're doing that handheld, um, documentary style. I was just wondering, because I'm about to AD a project with a similar style, uh, if your focus concerns come into that a lot. Do you just shoot on you know, a, a shorter lens, I guess? <laughs> so it doesn't matter? Or do you have your, just try to maintain that same difference? Oh, you're talking about what type of camera is it? I'm, well, we're going to be shooting on a red. So. OK. But I'm just talking about when you're in this constantly moving environment, you're wrapping around corners. And it, I'm assuming it would be hard to maintain the exact same difference between you and your subject. I was just wondering if you did come into focus issues. You know, what I've come into focus with you issues most is these, um, are you familiar with the 5Ds and 7D mm -hmm. Canons? Mm -hmm. They're DSLRs. Mm -hmm. These cameras were kind of invented almost by accident. Uh, I think one of the technicians in, in the uh, Canon lab, they're working on flash memory technology trying to make a, a motor drive for the cameras, basically, is what I heard. And um, he said, why don't you just put a you know, flash memory drive with SD cards in the camera. So you end up with this DSLR that has great uh, Super 35 gate. You know, the, the aperture is as big as a Super 35 camera, which is amazing. But what happens there is the focus, this, this depth of field is so shallow and the picture looks great. It looks very cinematic. <coughs> Producers will say, well, this is sort of a problem now. But mm -hmm. um, I guess you guys have experienced that if you ever used. If you can't ever, move. Yeah. I mean, you, your subject has to stay right there or <coughs> you're, any, any hook yeah. you're gone. Yeah. So it's almost developed its own sort of look, you know, genre even, this look, because the focus is so shallow. Mm -hmm. um, this is probably not as big an issue with the, like, the red. You just. You basically need because um, you can control the, the depth of field almost like a almost like a real like a movie camera with that. But if you're talking about you're just talking about focus issues, yeah, a wider lens clearly will give you uh, a lot more depth of field. I just thought since we we were shooting it, and I'm going to be ading it. I was just wondering about any problems that came up a lot with that kind of style or or not. That was no, just to have a good focus polar. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, Many films have been shot with these 5Ds, and this, uh, focus is definitely the biggest problem with it. <coughs> they look great. I mean, it looks oh, great. Yeah. It's funny, but the producers, you know, well, this is a what three thousand dollar camera that you can, and it looks, it looks great. It looks like a very cinematic, you yeah. know, with, and it's all because of this really short focus. Uh, I guess the main problem with those is that they're, they're the apparatus to keep them in, in focus. They're usually just a focus ring on the lens. So now there's a sort of a cottage industry of aftermarket manufacturers that make all the little pieces that you can connect to it with the follow focus and rods and 
map boxes and things like that. Uh, it's yeah, that's a whole other discussion. That's a big. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, they're terrific. They're um, use them for music videos and commercials. You know, with that short focus, what happens is you're always running through the focus ring, and you you know fight to try to keep your subject in focus. But for editors, it's made sort of they're for good for cut points. You know, so you're all familiar with you know music videos that go intentionally out of focus. It's a little bit of a tired. Uh, Aesthetic, but <laughs> this is what we got now with the, all the, the proliferation of 5Ds and 7Ds and stuff like that. Um, now, any other questions for? I'm just going to show you know, some some of this uh, film and talk a little bit about the style, the way we're approaching it, in sort of a quasi documentary way. Yeah, uh, I guess this might be sort of a connecting question between his and what you're about to do. Um, on <coughs> You know, a lot of big budget narrative movies, the director of photography often is not the camera operator. You know, there's a dedicated camera. That's correct. Do you operate on your narrative stuff that you I do? I do. Uh, I don't as much anymore. No? Yeah. So is that My weird? Like I, going I, because <laughs> I've always, not that I'm, but I mean, the stuff that I've lit, I've also shot with the camera. So mm -hmm. is, it, is that a strange thing to hand off to somebody else to do? It is, yeah. You have to, you know, you know, operating as a, yeah, it's such a subjective thing. There's no real rules about, you know, some people have, you know, in a, a typical narrative, uh, you know, indie movie or studio movie, you know, some operator will cut the head off, the actor's head off here, and some will leave headroom like that. So if you're not really comfortable, and if you know your operator well, mm -hmm. it can be a really frustrating thing. I think that's why probably the first 10 or so features that I did them all myself. Until I found somebody that, you know, that I feel comfortable operating with. Uh, <coughs> um, I don't know what I was going to say. So. Well, the, the first part of your question was. Well, I just since he was asking about like the handheld aesthetic and you were talking yeah. about focus pullers and stuff. If you were the operator, that might be something that would just concern. Then that's your concern, I guess. But if, if then if it's. There's another operator in a way that's sort of their responsibility as far as depth of field and focus issues. I mean, I'm sure I guess you would set the stop that you're lighting to, but the yeah. operator and the AC would have to keep the movie in focus. So. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Normally, when I do these things, it's more of a, a hands on. You know, I like to have the, the gear with me, uh, you know, either lighting gear or camera gear so I can, you know, really get people, you know, working with the stuff. This, this, this format's more of kind of a show and tell. I'm going to just show some stuff and, and uh, try to try to uh, convey <coughs> some information for anybody that's really aspiring to you know, get into the business or further their way into it. Um, that's a pretty big discussion too, since you know the democratization of this the new digital media is now you know to the point where everybody uh, you know can, can make a movie, which, which is really great, uh, especially you know in documentary. Uh, there's a lot of great stories to be told out there, you know. Um, the, in narratives, I'm finding uh, in the film festivals in the last five or six years, um, less, I don't know, I want to say, I guess just less imagination. <laughs> and uh, that's why I'm really happy to be here working on the jury. To Aristotle said that there was like 36 possible s stories. You know, if you look now at days, it seems like there might be only you know, much fewer, maybe three. <laughs> but in documentaries, it's great. It's uh, everybody's got you know a story to tell, and that's I'm so happy that people can get you know their their DSLRs or their you know uh, DX100s or you know all that stuff. I don't even know the names of these things. Names. Um, yeah, I guess if you guys can hear it. Um, this film was shot on super 16 millimeter, and you, you can see there's more, you know, quite a bit more field than say a 5D, but if we, if we notice in that, that desert scene that we had, it was in the middle of the, of the desert, we, we really didn't have, you know, a way to light up that whole desert. If we had a 5D, that thing picks up light so well because of its sensor, it's, it's so large, so 
that's how this thing would be different. If it shot today, it probably wouldn't be shot in Super 16. Yeah, it would be on some kind of probably a digi uh, an Alexa or something like that. Uh, if you notice, this uh, every shot is handheld. Uh, we didn't really. This is what I talked about earlier. It's a uh, you know clearly a narrative with actors and everything, but I'm always here. It's not the kind of, you know, in a lot of ways, you don't even notice that it's handheld. You actually had two operators with these weird rigs they call Easy Rig. And it's, uh, it's just a way to, uh, just a way to have be handheld and not be so shaky. You know, Steven Soderbergh did a picture called Traffic, which was kind of almost, uh, you know, dealing with the same area, you know, Mexico and stuff. But, you, you know, that was clearly uh, kind of a wacky you know, sort of, uh, intense handheld. Uh, we we wanted to take a different approach, and, uh, you know, much much more of a subtle. Approach. How about this shot? How did you shoot this? Yeah, this again handheld, just in the back of a pickup truck, and okay. yeah, car to car. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's amazing that this this was actually over ten million dollars, but <laughs> by the time all the actors were paid and everything, it was really filmed very much like a very very small. You know, to see here, there's, you know, we're really shooting without lights. How, how we had, in this shot, we just had a flashlight bouncing into a white car. So it was really, this film was very much shot like a, as if it were like a, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollar indie movie. Um, that was just a great way to um, be able to, you know, get the actors that he wanted and, and still, still shoot it sort of, you know, independent, almost like a documentary. Did you have a question there? Oh, no, I was asking you how you lit the actors in the back of the truck. How we lit them? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was just saying. Uh, we just it literally had a flashlight, you know, uh, bouncing into a white car. Wow. Yeah. So we did got, you know, some old, some old school indie techniques working here. Uh, we filmed in a slaughterhouse in Mexico. No one would have us here in the U.S. Uh, you know, once they read the script, it was sort of like, uh, here we are. <laughs> sort of disparaging the American beef industry. But in Mexico, uh, we said, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we like to sell our beef to the United States. States. Which of the new ones? Yeah, and actually this slaughterhouse, they, you know, they actually, in a way, they do it right. I mean, Chihuahua is known for their beef, you know, almost like Argentine beef. So uh, there's a worker who's missing an arm. You know, this film is, I don't know how many people read the book, but it's, sort of, it's a strange translation from the nonfiction to the fiction in this case. Um, it doesn't really follow the bo book. It, you know, the book's just full of facts and figures and things like that. that you know, would, would actually make a probably a boring documentary. So I think that Richard's intention here, you know, was to uh, do have these parallel stories of the migrants coming over to work in, you know, pre, pre poor conditions without any kind of, you know, organized, you know, labor unions or anything like that, and uh, the dangers associated with it, and also, um, you know, that, as you all know, that it's, it's mainly about uh, how, the, how the beef is made and how, the, how it's got all the, you know, chemicals and hormones and stuff in it, so it's not really trying to be sort of a, a polemic, it's, you know, it's trying to weave the intention of the book into this story of uh, this this small family here that uh, you see the high school kid. So it's kind of a he's going back to his kind of days in his youth days and weaving that kind of you know youth into this migrant story. Mm -hmm. It's kind of two parallel stories going on. Uh, I'd rather just talk, you know, if anybody has any questions, we can actually turn this off. I, I just wanted to show about five minutes or so. Lee, Lee, when you were in pre-production, did, did you and uh, Richard use uh, photographs uh, as reference? Uh, that's uh, funny. <laughs> I've just seen a lot of still photography. Yeah, you know, and I have to admit this because and <laughs> I always sort of chuckle when, um, Producers or directors or art directors, you know, pull out the, you know, the Edward Hopper picture, you know, the guy in the, what is it, what's the name of that? Nighthawks at the Diner. Nighthawks at the Diner, that's the one, you know, and I 
can't tell you how many times that it's been referenced in everything from music videos to <coughs> movies. But it, sure enough, uh, in this film, there was a shot of Greg Kinnear in the Mickey's alone by himself <laughs> eating the hamburgers. <laughs> and we literally referenced that painting of Edward Hopper. Which, that, so we just, yeah, we went with the cliche all the way. But yeah, that, that we referenced, uh, not really that much else. Uh, we saw, we were more inspired by this, what is that Michael Winterbottom movie about the, I think there's some Afghans or Turks that were uh, making their way across <coughs> to London. Yeah. Uh, it was another, world. another migrant, was it? New <coughs> World. New, oh, well. Yes, yeah, something world, because when he gets there, he, something says, world? he says, is your friend with me? And says, he says, no, he's not in the world. Yeah, that's, that's the one. That's the, that's the main thing we referenced for this picture. That thing was all handheld, shot digitally on a, uh, It's PD 150, right. yeah. and it's widescreen. So that was our main inspiration for the way we shot this. Yeah. And did you guys talk about any kind of color scheme before? Uh, yeah, we did. It was um, it was mainly the, the color scheme that you normally see with um, associated with uh, fast food uh, restaurants. You know, the yellows and reds. You know, Burger King and McDonald's use that, so we, we try to incorporate that in as much as possible and limit the amount. You know, sometimes we'll, on some pictures they'll try to keep all, you know, uh, you know, blue out of the film. You know, and, but mainly it's it's sort of just naturalistic. You know? Yeah, I think the main thing we talked about color-wise was the was the color scheme of fast food restaurants. And mainly colors not found in nature. <laughs> <laughs> Synthetic colors. Yeah. Yeah. Popcorn, maybe. Uh, so going yeah. back to your night scene in the desert, um, yeah. we're, I'm in pre-production for a project right now. One of the big discussions with the DP is that we don't have enough power to light a very fast area and make it that is precisely the problem we had there, yeah, and it was a like big problem. With Dear Moon, right? And so I've heard that, say, Babel, they gave them flashlights, because that was easiest way to get rid of that problem. But do you have a, yeah. a I don't know, like something that you need to use or something that to get, get across? Well, I've problem. never been in a situation where we had, were in the middle of the desert when we had, well, I think, 20 immigrants, you know, these actors walking through, and they're all, you know, it's really wide. You know, tried to, that's the way. Did they studied this pretty carefully. Did it's you time it to shoot with moonlight to help or you? Or we actually you? had a construction crane that was about 100 feet that held a big, uh, like a like a parachute, you know, with, with uh, about, it was really only about 5,000 watts of light, which is not much, but it was enough just to give a little bit of glow to it. And yeah, they, just like you're saying with the flashlights, we had the car, car headlights. That was really a big problem with, uh, you know, shooting on Super 16 in the dark like that with very little light. We were pushing it to the edge, and you can see the grain in there. It's even with so your 5K looks sorky once it goes into flat. Yeah, light. well, we had it going through a big, like a balloon, like a parachute type of thing, like a big china ball. Right. But you know, it's just it was because our lim budget was so limited that we couldn't. You know, normally we would have a 20, a 20,000 watt light or two in in that kind of situation. Here we were on in the middle of Mexico with very little money, and that's all we could get. So, <laughs> so yeah, generators. you can see the grain in there. It's pretty bad. So yeah. Did you have generators out there? We did have a generator. <laughs> so this LED lights are now battery. Yeah, now like the way you can shoot really that cool scene now is so LED much easier. LED lights are battery operated that you can use in the field. That are yeah, I mean like even that. a 5D in that kind of situation will kill this. I mean it, it, the performance is so much better. You know that's. That's a good attribute, I think, for a lot of the new digital cameras. They pick up light a lot better than film does. So you don't need the big 20,000 watt lights. So you really don't anymore. Yeah. Um, sort of, since a lot of people, probably everybody in here that's shooting something is probably shooting on digital format and probably mm -hmm. in some form of DSLR or whatever. But um, you know, if everybody does now shoot at, say, 800 ISO or 1600 or whatever, um, Kind of a leading question, but do things still need to be 
lit versus just no, you know I, uh, available light or how do, yeah. Uh, I mean, one thing I I took when I had the chance to meet uh, Sven Nyqvist and interview him for a magazine once, and I I took a lot. I didn't get to talk to him for very long, but I did. He's the great cinematographer of Bergman, you know. And uh, he told me, uh, you know, I just yeah, I looked at a film that he had directed called The Ox, which was a period piece shot in Scandinavia, and it was just looked so beautiful and so natural. Of course. In latitudes like that, you have beautiful light all the time. You have these really long twilights. But I just asked him about, you know, just his production package, what it, what it was. He said there were three lights on the entire, three tungsten lights. And uh, he said just don't light it unless it needs to be lit. You know? Sometimes you need to light because you might f come to a location, you've got great window light coming through. The problem is that window light's not going to stay that way if you get a 10-page scene to shoot. In that case, you need to artificially produce what that window light's doing. You know, when you arrive on the, on the set, I mean, you arrive and you say, oh, this looks great, why, why do we need to light it? Well, if you're gonna be there for 10 or 12 hours, you probably need to, so that it doesn't change with the, you know, with the sun. So but you're, <coughs> in those low light situations, you guys are just bumping the ISO till it looks good and then dealing with the, the digital noise in post? Yeah, now you, yeah. You can go easily, uh, you know, you could so-called push or, you know, or bump the ISO up to say, I think 6,400 now with limited grain, limited uh, washing out of the blacks, which that's the most amazing thing of the new digital, in my opinion. Yeah, they can really, they're really sensitive to, to uh, you know, low, low light situations. Uh, yeah. Uh, shots performance videos of uh, rock bands. Yeah. One thing I learned is the one thing you do have to watch in digital is black is not really black. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're bumping it high ISO. What I usually do is if I need black, I sample the black section. I do not use real black because the dark noise, okay, and you might not think about it, but subconsciously, just testing with some subjects, they notice black versus black. So like you get room tone for sound, yeah. Yeah. you need a dark sample. Uh -huh. To lay in there, to it starts getting, there. Yeah, yeah, to composite when it starts getting a little muddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's it, that's an excellent uh, observation. Uh, any other lighting questions? Because I was going to go into show something else that's even more. Um, I'm just about documentary shooting, not really lighting. Uh, this is shot. <laughs> this is a kind of a quasi, almost a fake documentary about hobos. Um, Freight train. It's a film my brother made that I, I helped him shoot. Um, it's black and white. It's shot on a si it's 16 millimeter shot on a Bolex. <laughs> yeah. And you know you can still get these cam. You can find you can find a camera like this if you want to try shooting film. You can get a you know a, one one of these cameras for uh, you know 25 dollars at a garage sale. And you can get loaded up with 100 feet of film, you know, if you still have a hankering for, you know, the way things used to be done. This shot, this is actually filmed 15 years ago. So. Good. And it's, it's a mixture of actually Super 8 and uh, 16 mm My intention originally was to bring some of the stuff I'd done before and sort of then show you what I've done uh, just last month, finished my first digitally shot feature. Uh, the funny thing about it was they couldn't give it to me on any format that I can show it on, so they have it in some kind of strange file. So uh, that was the original intention, to show you some of this old stuff and then show you something that I just recently shot last month on Alexa. Uh, besides commercials, music videos, and a few 
few documentaries, so that's the only thing I've done some digital, so I'm, I'm kind of behind on that. Uh, probably some of you guys know a lot more about it than I do. This film uh, was, we had, um, like I said, a Bolex and a, um, a little Walkman crystal sink Walkman, you know, when we remember those things. And we were just, uh, had everything in our backpack and went up from uh, West Texas to Klamath Falls, Oregon. And uh, that that is it's supposed to be a documentary, but it was sort of uh, sort of ended up being we put some fictional characters in there we took with us. Some some actors actually, so it's sort of a fake documentary. Yeah, um, can you talk a little bit about your experience with the Alexa um, and shooting yeah. your first digital feature? Anything it specific to that camera that you thought was yeah. more Yeah, no, yeah, the, the Alexa <coughs> is, is just, um, <laughs> she's great. She's, uh, it's, you know, when I do uh, red shoots, I usually have to bring an extra body or two because uh, they'll, they'll just, uh, you know, they're really subject to uh, heat moisture, they'll, you know, you have to bring an extra body along. Now with an Alexa, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's like a movie, you can drop it mm -hmm. and it won't, you know, <coughs> it won't break. You can get set, you can uh, expose it to extreme heat, rain, you can, you know, that's what I really like about it. The dynamic range is much greater too. Uh, I'll, I'll, in, in addition to that, um, it, you can actually, there's a separate recording system called, they call it Rec 709. So you've got Airy Raw that lays down uh, a, you're basically like a flat pass, if you will, uh, which is very, you know, the blacks aren't black and, and the white, you know, everything is sort of gray and mid-range. So you know, it's all in the mid-range so you can, you know, in post, you can, you can use, do a lot more with it. It's almost like having, you know, a negative, yeah. if you will. And then simultaneously, you can record on a, what they call this uh, your own lookup table, which is a customized. You can literally get on, uh, I think, it, a program called an Airy Look, and you can you can literally be do like you would if you had a DaVinci coloring system, mm -hmm. and you can dial in your color, your look, your contrast, everything like that in camera, mm -hmm. you know, before you even shoot. Wow. And that's what was. Beautiful. I was able to do that. We we got uh, we we got some pretty extreme colors, greens and yellows, uh, and we, we kind of amped them up. So we're recording both ways. So in post, if they decide they don't want it that way, you know they can they can they can color it. That's that's the di big difference between the red and the, and the airy. Any big drawbacks you found? With these? Um, yeah, just like the viewing system. I you know I kind of missed the. Looking through the ocular, if you will, you know the the, the eyepiece of the camera, and hearing the you know in my ear the the mag going you know, the film going through the mag, but that's pretty much it. I think with the airy camera, it's uh, they they basically it's here to stay. Now you can you know there's no going back. I think you know I think if you know Kodak, I've always was thinking that they might have something going on. There's scientists up there in Rochester trying to devise a mm, like a synthetic uh, alternative to the silver halide particles that are in the cellu you know, cellular celluloid of the film, because you know that stuff is uh, it's really tiny, tiny grains of silver, and that's why film is so expensive because mm -hmm. it's all has to do with this market price of silver. So the film, you know, the roll of, uh, price roll of film will go up and down based on the, the, the market cost of silver. So if they could, and they still may do this, I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of probing around to the, the Kodak reps, seeing if there's anything like that going on. Because if they could find some kind of alloy 
that could replace the silver content in the celluloid, then you could drop the roll of film down to say $40, $50. Then it would be still still viable because even with the even with the Alexa, you know, there's still it's still it's not there as far as contrast goes. You know, able to, to rein in the contrast of, the, of that range. Um, if you've got a negative, you know, you, you can, you can, you, you still work with a lot more. So I'm, I'm just still hopeful that the people at Kodak will, will come up with sort of, a, you know, a synthetic uh, substitute for the silver halide in, the, in film. Uh, but yeah, I think that with the Aria Alexa, and they're, they're becoming very affordable now, too. So any one of y'all could probably go rent one, you know, for less than a, a film camera, you know. And, uh, yeah, they'll be competing. You know, I think there's a lawsuit going on right now. Uh, I don't, I'm not, I'm not privy to all the details, but Red is suing Alexa, Aerie. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> for, like, I proprietary th think, stuff that they think is Yeah, I think uh, the censor, the COC sensor, or whatever that thing's mm -hmm. called. It's that's like that's the scuttlebutt. Mm -hmm. It's like patent war. Is it? Yeah, it's, like, it's kind of a patent war. Well, I heard that there was uh, some break in with email, but that might be oh, right. totally different. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah, I wish I could. Uh, I would have loved to have an Alexa here to show all you guys because it, it really is amazing. Because with the lookup table that, that you have on there, you can customize your look before you even shoot. Mm -hmm. Unlike the red. So kind of a connected question to this is if you're doing something that has a, a narrative project that's got a pretty brisk shooting schedule because it doesn't have a, lot, a big budget and you're shooting a lot of night exteriors in, let's say, neighborhood streets in an yeah. urban area, it, would that camera be something that would be conducive to that schedule and, and lots of, say, night shooting with minimal to no yeah. lighting equipment? Yeah, exactly. The, the, the schedules, this, this is across the board even in with films and schedules and the budgets, everything's getting shrunk. So there's more and more uh, pressure to be able to work much faster. And this allows you to do that. Yeah, this film that shot, it was a uh, hundred and, th we filmed it in Austin. Uh, it was a hundred and twenty page script in 15 days. Wow. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't think we could have done that if we shot the film. Yeah, so it does really help you speed up. How many locations were there? Two. Oh. <laughs> That's the only way. That's the only way to do that. Yeah. But there's more and more pressure to, to, you know, to shoot ten pages per day you know, when you're shooting a narrative. Yeah. Did you have some <coughs> original digital part of like unloading and <coughs> backing up and all that kind of thing? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, it is almost like a ch mag change because. Although they do have two, uh, they're, they're S by S cards, I don't know if you know what those are. They're, they're kind of like a compact flash card or an SD card. It's, I think it's proprietary to Aerie, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, we each one holds like 14 minutes. <coughs> now there's two slots and one will go to the next after you finish the first, but then you've got some post business. So we actually literally would just shoot on one card and change it, I mean, it was almost like uh, a mag, mag change. In fact, I'm so fearful of losing data now that because it's happened and it happens all the time. I hear horror, horror stories, and it's actually happened to me. And after it happened once, I decided I was going to take all the film cans that I have left over because I have no use for them anymore, give them to the camera assistants and the DIT guy. Take this card and put it in the black bag. <laughs> Put it in the can and tape it up with a piece of black tape. <laughs> and take it to the, you know, and take it to the person that's downloading it into the hard drive. So it is almost very much like a mag change, but you can work a lot faster. It's true. Yeah. Just a question for the test myself. Um, in your relationship with director, at what point do you come on a pre-production as a feature or as a doctor? Right. Well. Uh, with Linklater, uh, it's a little different because we're neighbors, yeah. and so, <laughs> so we have a chance to talk about things like long in advance. Like for example, in fast food nation, you know, we talked about we talked about it for uh, you know several couple months beforehand, and 
say it goes back to slap and days in the case as well. Normally about a week. But uh, yeah, a six week production would probably, typically it's two, two weeks of prep. Yeah, so. D does that include all your location tech service? Yeah, yeah, the first week, uh, yeah, there'll be, there'll be scouting and then uh, finding crew, that kind of thing. The next week will be tech scouting. You know, once you've found, you, once you've got your crew, uh, you'll go out in, a, you know, like a 15 passenger van with the, you know, the assistant director, your gaffer, uh, key grip, art director, you know, production designer, and uh, producer director, and location scout. So that's pretty typical. Yeah. What was the production day for that? Pardon? How long has to be mentioned after the production? Yeah, that was very quick too. Uh, that was 20 days. Yeah. And that was many, many locations. There was. Uh, 30, nearly 30 locations on that. And for three states, Colorado, Chihuahua, and Texas. That was ex yeah. that was the hardest movie I've ever shot that <coughs> Yeah. A lot of moves, a lot of company moves. Did you bring on, you said there were two cameras, did you bring on the second camera? Or you got someone you know? Yeah, I would do, like I had the main operator and then I would operate the second camera. Okay. Yeah, but we had two cameras going almost all, and we had a su two Super 16 cameras, which they have 800 foot magazines for these things, so we could roll for 22 minutes straight. So it's almost it was almost like uh, almost like shooting digital, where you don't you can just roll, keep rolling without having to change the mag. Yeah, yeah. Well, why did you choose uh, film and sound digital that one? That permission. Pardon? Why did you choose uh, to shoot on film and sound? Why? Uh, that's a good question. We considered shooting on digital. Because of the that that reason that you know it it did it definitely went went slower you know if we shot it digitally we could have you know we, we could have done it a lot a little easier we could have moved a lot faster what was the goal of the film uh I think it was I don't think I had, I mean <laughs> I think it was Richard's uh, he probably just wasn't quite ready to he had done two things digitally before but they were animated. Yeah, we kind of figured it's in the budget, you know. The last time we probably, sh yeah, shoot a film. Do you guys think you have to realize uh, kids? Pardon me? Like this? Yeah. Do you like the kids you have in the unit? Did you try to keep it super simple? Oh, yeah, we had to. Yeah, yeah we had a very small truck. Yeah. yeah. With 5K, it was really a song. Yeah, it really, it really was. Yeah. yeah. You used use one 5K on the. But some of the night exteriors in the U.S. were yet actually. Yeah, we, we're also in the midst of a 12-year project, which we're also shooting on film, but that'll probably be the last the last one. Uh, we're in, currently, we shoot, it's episodic, but there's a uh, shoot for like one week per year. And uh, it was sort of inspired by Michael Apted's documentary, uh, the BBC one, the 28 of, or what is that now, 56, 56 or something? <laughs> yeah. But that's the nonfiction. What he's done is he's written a story about a kid growing up from age six to eighteen. So in three years' time, we'll have finished the twelve years, and he'll he'll edit it all together and not really episodes. It'll hopefully be sort of seamless, and you'll see this kid grow up in in the span of two hours from age six to eighteen. That goes out fiction, into the world. Fiction? and that's on we shoot that on thirty five. Yeah, it's scripted. It's scripted, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that, yeah, that's sort of, you know, if you look at uh, Linklater's films, like, there we do kind of sort of mix the sort of documentary style a little bit. It's, it's just, it's part of the process of being able to tell your story and work, work faster under, you know, tighter schedules and things like that. Yeah? Do you storyboard or pre-plan your your shot selection and your angles and stuff before you get before you arrive or, or after you get there and just start kind of moving the camera around and see what looks good. Or? No, uh, well, in the case of Linklater, we shoot fairly conventionally, so <coughs> we've done so many that we just sort of you know we just go by the numbers pretty much. Uh, we don't try to really 
break new, you know, break rules and you know. Uh, what I was gonna say was, um, uh, sorry, what was your question? Storyboards. It's just storyboarding, or, or whatever. Yeah. You just oh, kind of yeah. pick yeah. it on the your angles and stuff on the fly, or. Well, you you know when you're doing stunts, it's almost essential right. to storyboard. Uh, so. Um, yeah, whenever you got any sort of action sequences or stunts, I can you know both. It's it's pretty important, and then you distribute them, uh, you know, to all the departments, so everybody knows. And but, I mean, like your your narratives and like you know, Food Nation, which is kind of half. Yeah, that the film we never there were no storyboards or anything on that. It's just sort of yeah, we just sort of winged it. Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty fast and furious, that picture. What is the, uh, this is probably different for every director, but you know, for narrative stuff you've mostly worked with, with Linklater. What, what's the relationship as far as who decides exactly where the camera goes and like what lens you're gonna use? Is that, I mean, does he, like what's the relationship um, that way? Yeah, I think at the, by this point it's kind of a mutual and you know, it's already, it's, not, it's almost like we don't even discuss it that much. But, um, you know, he, he's a fairly, um, yeah, he knows his lenses. Uh, he doesn't use a lot, you know. If you'll look at Linklater films, he, he never uses many close-ups or long lenses. You won't see telephotos. So we use prime lenses. We use basically three lenses. Uh, I think it's probably the effect of his, uh, he went through a phase of watching all the Robert Brosson's films and, and Ozu, which only used one lens. And we kind of started out that way when we slacker. We, because of that, we thought it would be, I don't know, interesting to try to see if we could, well, budget-wise, we could, you know, we could only afford one, you know, one prime lens. So we shot that whole movie on one lens. And since then, yeah, his his lens repertoire is just, you know, there's maybe a 18, a 25, and a 50, maybe 35. So that's about it. But I've worked, you know, with other people like Toby Hooper, for example. This guy is a photographer. He, you know, he knows. He's almost like a, you know, he's a cinematographer. So he'll be very specific about, you know, like you'll have three cameras and you know, like one camera on a hi hat here with an 18 millimeter, and one over here with a 35, and you know, one here with a 50. He'll be very specific about it. And then there's other directors that don't know and don't care to know, and they give it all to you. In terms of where to put the camera, and you know, they might rely on the script supervisor, even, or you know, just to try to match things. That frustrates me to you as a cinematographer. Pardon? That frustrates me to you as a cinematographer. Doing their job? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, um, it's not so bothersome, though, really. Uh, um, the, the last movie I did was with a woman who never had done, she'd only done small stage. So, uh, yeah, she really 100% on, on, on me to place the camera and, and the lenses. Yeah. They were fine. It did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I must, I, I come, I must be really frustrated with this thing. Their main bug all over the direction, the rim not being able to. Yeah. Work. Yeah, it was quite frustrating. <laughs> but I was able to use the Alexa, which I really I wanted to really get into, because that's where we're, we're going now, you know. Probably not looking back, so. Uh, yeah, uh, my intention was to bring that footage and show you guys, and kind of, kind of sort of juxtapose it against this other stuff. Has, has your experience on the red camera been so terrible that you actually you won't touch anymore? Yeah. Has anyone here used the red camera? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, it does the job, you know? It just, it's a little, it's, it's got its own weird in, idiosyncrasies. It's, you know, there's, it's noisy, you know, sometimes the fans that pull the camera are sometimes too loud. Yeah, there's, and in Texas where it's so hot, it just, sometimes they'll just melt, melt down. Yeah. But I use, uh, with a lot of the digital shooting I do, now I, I, I use a, um, a device called NanoFlash. And um, 
it's sort of rendered some of these older like cameras that we were tape drive cameras that uh, you know they record 1080 but they record on tape. What this does, if any camera like a, uh, say the one like a Canon XL H1, you know those Canons that were so nice that everybody had, but it has an SDI output. You can run that straight to this thing called Nano Flash. It records on a compact flash drive, and it eliminates the drive, the tape drive altogether. So now you're recording like you know, fully uncompressed 422, uh, you know, color space. Which four years ago, a camera that could do that would cost you 150 thousand dollars. And so for three thousand dollars, you can get the, you can buy these things at out of B and H or somewhere like that. There's another one I can't remember. So now, uh, it basically weighs under a pound, and just Velcro it to the back of the camera or onto the battery. It records audio, too. Yeah, it records audio, too. And then you've got this, again, you've got this little bitty card, though. This is what makes me so scared. <laughs> At least they're bigger than the SD cards. The SD cards that, that you know, record, I think, 5Ds? Five 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 well, five compact five flash on a 5D and, and the... The is it the 70 that has the SD card? Yeah, yeah. SD yeah. and T2I, T3I, I and 60D. Right. They've lost, like they've lost, you know, wow. That's like the equivalent of, you know, like flashing a roll of film or something, you know. So that's why I do this now. I take the ca film cans literally and give them to, like put this little card in the can, take it up, <laughs> take it to the DIT. <laughs> it sounds a little excessive. Yeah, so if you want to get into purchasing, I've held out on purchasing digital equipment before because, you know, you get something and it's obsolete in six months. And so with this Nano Flash, uh, what's the Demon number name of the other one that Nike? There's a Key Pro Mini, uh, but there's yeah. also like the Ninja. They're really great, and they, you can, they've got a little on the back, they've got a little, and there's two slots, so you can record, you got a 64 gig card, you can record uh, a P2 card. It's like a P2 card. A little smaller, about half the size. In fact, P2 cards, I understand, are actually cleverly disguised compact flash cards. <laughs> <laughs> but I like those because they're bigger and they're, they're big, digital yeah. camp. Of all the gripes and moans about digital, that's, you know, it's just sort of a, a, there's a sort of an acceptance about it. Uh, but to me, it's a, my biggest concern is losing data. You know? Well, you, you the say cameras, you the resolution is there, you know, it's, it's, so I've, I'm, I've, you know, I've come around to accept it. Dump the cards on site and mm -hmm. to back them up and then keep the card also, or is that your plan, or is that how Pardon you work? Yeah, or? do you uh, dump the information then and put the card, or do you save the information on the card and back and keep the data? No, you take, yeah, take the card and then uh, dupli duplicate, get get right. two different, put on two different hard drives. But do you, do you buy the cards on those? Yeah. Yeah, because these cards, you know, they, they, they do get costly, you know, if you can figure well, out the cards. So then there's the advantage of the compact flash and the SD over that is that the inexpense, because you can, yeah. you know, you can get a 32 gig SD card for 35 bucks. And so, yeah. I mean, I know in my bag I've got 12 cards. <laughs> yeah, well, that's so. great, because, you know, I wouldn't recommend getting too big a card, not just, not because of the cost. Right. Because if something should happen to that, if it could get corrupted or lost, right? But you there lost are everything, so you can record onto a sixteen. As we've moved on, and, and you know, the what we develop now is that when as soon as the SD card comes out of the camera, it goes into a laptop, gets backed up to a laptop, right. it does not get erased, it gets put away. Mm -hmm. So now you've got it on the card, and you've got it in your laptop. Yeah, but that set. would take you through what just a one a one day shoot. Or well, no, because again, form. I've got you know tons oh, you of cards, so, many, so yeah. I can just keep you know. But I'm saying, I know my data is backed up because I have it on the laptop and I have it on the card. Yeah, but the card's gonna it's gonna be erased. It's gonna eventually. Be, it'll be reformed. Eventually, it'll be reported. But I'm just saying, you're talking about being afraid of losing yeah. your data. Well, they, you get a little yeah. bit more peace of mind if you're backing it up as you're pulling it out of the camera. It's true if you have a lot of cards. That's yeah. The thing. Many productions, believe it or not, you know they come they show up with maybe four cards. And they just recycle them. Uh, it was even a, it, on this Alexa shoot that I did last month. It was also, it was a concern, you know, uh, budget-wise. They, you know, they, I mean, I think we only had uh, five, five of the uh, or six SS S by S cards. Uh, they they also look like a, a compact flash card too. 
but I'm pretty sure it's proprietary to ARI. I don't even know what S by S means. It's like S X S. Anybody know? <laughs> but yeah, I've been really having to get you know crash course on all this, but uh, like I say, the you know the resolution is there. It, uh, you know, ever since digital became, uh, in my opinion, valid once they got over the problem of uh, recording you know, the frame rates when Panasonic figured out a way to have a 24 frame video, you know, 24p, basically, what was the camera, the uh, HVX100? Yeah. That's when it sort of became, oh, well, it, this looks like film, right? You know, it has that, that interface, you know, that persistence of the, end, of the, the flicker, in other words, that you find in film. And so it doesn't have a really, you know, the video. So once the 24 p came, I realized it's, you know, now it's within five years' time. It's, you know, with everybody, lots of people will be making movies and, uh, and, and it's, cre it's cre created this huge, um, it's a whole new industry that they call the prosumer, prosumer industry. And um, it's great. It has sort of driven down uh, the day rates uh, because there's so much more, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the more, the more, much more people in the game. Uh, you know, when I s was coming up as a camera assistant, you know, I had to go, um, go through training basically as an apprentice quite some time, you know, to learn the ropes and how to load, and then I became a second, worked my way up, a second assistant, uh, worked on many movies as an assistant, then became a focus puller, and did that for a few years, uh, you know, raised enough money to uh, buy a camera, an Airflex uh, SR, and was able to get, at the right time, it's when a lot of music videos were being made, you could actually make money making music videos, because record labels we had budgets for, uh, you know, like a Nashville or an indie rock band that of the budget of maybe sixty or seventy-five thousand dollars to make a music video. And um, I guess they, they just don't really don't do those anymore. That, you know, they're doing either really low, you know, mm -hmm. budget or you know Taylor Swift million-dollar videos. So there was a time where music videos were actually people made careers doing music. Does anybody here do them? Yeah. The great camera break for the music video was with the playback. That's you right. You just love singing so you don't worry about the noise from the most Yeah. Band. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Plus you can switch the lens out for a different look. The same thing. Yeah. Yeah, the great camera. That's kind of one of the advantages. You were talking about the whole 4K thing or whatever is that when you're shooting 4K, you're, it's more forgiving because you can you can either shrink it down to fit, yeah. or you can crop it to what you really wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you don't. You know, if you, you were still talking about, sometimes you have the guys that cut off here, and sometimes they have this. Mm -hmm. But you can shoot to this all the time, and if you want this, mm -hmm. you can crop into that mm -hmm. and still That's maintain cool. resolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, but you have all the, those cards, so you can get all that data. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you know, two Ks will work because it's yeah. really all you need. You know. Um, unless you're doing this kind of stuff, right. I would say, you know, I would definitely go in 4K for, for doing green screen compositing, you know, layering stuff. It's important to shoot 4K in that, in that sense. Oh, uh, yeah. Sort of, uh, you were saying that, that, you know, when 24P came around, that was kind of the, you know, the deciding. It made me realize that this, yeah, this is, it's coming. Yeah, so the new, the, you know, the Hobbit movies that, are coming out the, that uh, yeah. Peter Jackson are directing. They're shooting it at 48 frames a second. Uh, Is that right? Yeah, and so it's going to be Peter you know, projected at 48p instead of 24p. Um, really? And James Cameron, you know, like their whole idea is that they're the pushing more frame rate is, is yeah. more immersive. Do you have a an more opinion? immersive? Yeah, that's sort of the idea is that you know since it more accurately replicates, I guess, the frame rate that we take reality point. into. That's interesting. Uh, it probably has less flicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so it doesn't have that look of. Yeah, I'm skeptical oh, about how that's going to look, but that's what that's what they're doing uh, uh, with, with the Hobbit. It's, it's going to be 48 frames a second. Well, well and Avatar was really actually love, shot love in that, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or I should, should say rendered in that. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Okay. I said Avatar was actually rendered in 48p, and it, it, a lot of it has to do with um, they. They're, Cameron and, and Jackson seem to think that sharper is better, and cameras have always had that little tiny bit of yeah, well, you know, blur or whatever, and and. They, you know, we don't see blur when we're looking, you know, when I'm looking at you or yeah. whatever, that kind of thing. And, and so they're thinking, no, people want to see what they see. They I'm just worried it's going to look like a sitcom or like a movie. absolutely right. They need, they need it sharper. That's why, yeah, that, I'm sure that's why they do it in a 48p. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because there's so many layers of compositing going on there. Yeah. What's the effect of 3D with digital? Do you need more data and sharpness for 3D? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I've never done it, anything in 3D before. Uh, 3D is I know two German directors. Like Werner Herzog now. did that one, 3D about the caves in France. Uh-huh. And then, um, um, who else? Ben Benders just made a 3D documentary as well. Oh, pardon? Yeah, yeah. Is there any? Yeah. Seemed like kind of a fad, kind yeah. of a trend. Yeah, Which I don't know. Um, eventually, maybe fade out. Well, I read that he said it was uh, the future of documentary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I read that he said it was uh, the future of documentary. Mm-hmm. 3D. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen a 3D uh, setup? Have you seen? Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, it's it's really involved. I mean, you look, yeah. you've literally got two cameras, sort of one p- pointing down into a mirror prism, and then one like this. So you're well, dealing with two cameras. Our Sony has yeah. the camera that actually just has the two separate yeah. lenses and Can you imagine? on one body, and you just shoot, you know. That's the new way. Going in to yeah. shoot like a Verite documentary. <laughs> but yeah, that's a pretty bold statement. Huh? The future of documentary is 3D. Future of post-MSA. Future of post one thing they did with the what, the big thing, I saw a 21st century, I had a chance to look at that. But the uh, <coughs> one thing is they have one now called the Hurricane, where the vertical camera is now under slow, so you don't have the big, okay. huge bulk overhead. Mm-hmm. You work in, in tighter quarters. But the thing about it is, I mean, even on the, the Sony and the Panasonic experimental, mm-hmm. uh, one thing you have to watch, though, is keep things natural, you still have to adjust your parallax to the two cameras. Right. Yeah, it seems like... And it's both problem. vertical and horizontal parallax you have to adjust. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll be just, they'll just be one unit of camera. They're working on automatic parallax. Yeah. I don't know if you think it's a fad. I, that's like sort of my first... I, I wouldn't think so only because it's all about movie theaters and ticket prices. Well, the and as long as they can charge me 10 bucks for a pair of glasses and then get them back at the end of the movie, <laughs> then... Well, there's a whole... Thing. Yeah, there's 3D televisions coming out in the future that are online and stuff like that. I think yeah. there's a large part of the industry going to it's pretty yeah. solid. Yeah. 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 I've, I've, heard, I've heard both things. Yeah. There's there are people, they're, you know, unlikely uh, proponents of the 3D to say that's the future, so... Mm-hmm. I don't, you know the... You know how... Uh, which was the one that uh, Alice in Wonderland, the Tim Burton one? That, did anyone see that? Mm-hmm. Beautiful My film, favorite. but there's maybe five or six shots that really are, you know, but you know, really come home as yeah. powerful 3D images. Yeah. So unless you can make every shot, you know, pay off in that way, you know, you need more. You need more planes, uh, and you need foreground, mid, and backgrounds to really make every shot work in 3D. So the actually the best 3D film I ever watched was a Andy Warhol. Avatar was fantastic in 3D because it was designed that way from the beginning. And right, you right. You'd watch Transformers where they put in four 3D shots of the entire movie and yeah. charge the premium and the whole thing. And the rest of it you could take your glasses off and watch because it was just normal. Right. Yeah, that, that's how I feel about it too. Yeah, um, yeah but, but Andy, if you get a chance to see Andy Warhol, if you're into 3D, it, it's kind of hard to find, but Andy Warhol's Frankenstein. Every <laughs> shot is great. Was that Anna Glyph? Pardon? Was that Anna Glyph? Anna Glyph. Where he filter glasses. He yeah, shot, yeah. Andy shot 3D or something? Yeah, yeah. Wow. I didn't know it's that. called Frankenstein. Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol's Frankenstein. One more question. Yeah, one more question. Yeah. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I ended up with 
3D. Well, that, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> We're going literally here to, to, towards the future, marching into it. <laughs> Head blown. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. Okay. Yeah. I mean,